episode 56, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format where you can learn about what physicians face through expert analysis. And today's expert is just me. I'll be giving a solo episode. We're going to talk about what I had posted on Twitter recently that I got a lot of engagement on. I thought I want to go a little bit more in depth. And for those of you who are not on Twitter, bless your souls, I think you'll find that this is a great example of the problems of the healthcare system and really viable solutions that are available right now. The other reason for the disjointed nature of the release of these shows is because my wife is launching her own podcast. So I've been helping her put that together. And so I apologize a little bit for the herky jerkiness of the release dates and the subject matter. I still have some great interviews lined up, and those are in the works, but I think you'll find that today's episode, although it's not an interview with another physician, will be really, really good. As always, you can find the show notes for the show at theparadox.com slash 056, that's P-R-A-D-O-C-S. There you can sign up for the email list so you can be notified when shows release. I'd recommend you go to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash theparadox. There you can be a patron supporter of the show. It's a great way for just $2 a month. Not only do you give me a nice attaboy, but also gives you access to all the interviews I've done on other podcasts. I think I'm now almost at a dozen where I talk about various things from politics to healthcare policy. But without further ado, my adventures into getting a Holter monitor and getting ripped off by the insurance company. Enjoy. My story begins a few months ago. I was under the weather for the week, probably some sort of flu, some upper respiratory infection of some sort, where it was one of those things where you're not sure if it's allergies at first, and then you realize that actually you're run down, it's far more than allergies, but it's something, but you could still kind of drive through it and keep working. And in medicine, that's just what we do, whether it's a smart thing or not. So I'd been going to work as normal. On Friday, I had a lot of a lot of trouble, a lot of abdominal pain for some reason, and I actually had to stay home from work, which almost never happens. It turns out I was okay, although I was pretty convinced that for a while there I was going to have to have an appendectomy or something because my abdominal pain was so bad. But I got better. Someone picked up my call. My group's great that way. But anyway, the next day I was on call in the hospital, and so I went and worked. And it was a Saturday, and I worked pretty much all day. I worked until probably about 3 or 4 in the afternoon, had a couple hours we got home, then I got called back in, did another case or two at night, got home again, and then went to bed around 9 or so or 10. I then get a page at about midnight uh, with another semi-emergent case, an urgent case. And as I'm trying to read my pager, I'm just fumbling through the buttons. I can't quite figure what's going on, but you know, I was woken up out of kind of a deep sleep and I always leave my pager at my bathroom. The next thing I know, I'm lying on the floor in the bathroom. There's blood everywhere. My wife's shaking kind of real scared because of course she's woken up dead night as hearing me just collapse. So I just had a syncopal episode. I fainted in my bathroom. I assume it was because of my cold or flu or whatever it was I had, a dehydrated, not taking care of myself, not drinking enough water. And you know what? I'm no longer 30. So you can't get away with those sorts of things when you get a little bit older. So anyway, I then go to the emergency room, get sewed up. Big, you know, someone takes care of my call. <clears throat> I then go see my doctor a few days later. So I had switched to a drug primary care doctor, actually the physician in episode two, Dr. Belina Mott who's great. I thought I've talked about direct primary care all the time. There's no reason I shouldn't have one. Besides, I have so much difficulty in seeing actually a physician when I go through my previous practice that I was a patient at since I really had moved to town. So anyway, I go see my doctor and we have a discussion for a while and she said, you know, you probably should have a Holter monitor. That's basically a monitor which checks your heart, watch your rhythm, just to see if you have any unusual beats or something weird going on that maybe you need to have addressed. The yield is very low, but it's a fairly inexpensive test in general, and it might be a a useful tool to find if there's something wrong. Additionally, my wife was really concerned there was something wrong. We're pretty sure it was the flu and me just not taking care of myself, but what if it was something else? So 
is almost more for reassurance for her and a little bit for me that I should do this Holter monitor. The backstory is, of course, that I go on spring break because it happened to be right at that time of year. And so I thought, I'll just do it when I get back. It's nothing urgent. We have a a good explanation for why I had the trouble and certainly not having sudden heart attacks or any sort of weird dysrhythmias as far as I can tell. Anyway, we discuss that we'll do it when I get back from spring break. And and a thing that never happened when I had my regular doctor, I (laughs) will call it from a previous practice. And also as an aside, I rarely would get sick. I was, I'm actually a pretty good patient to have in your patient panel because I don't really ever come in to see the doctor. Uh, a typical doctor, right? And through this whole episode, I learned the difference of having direct primary care. I have a doctor who really knows what's going on because as soon as I returned home from spring break, like I think the day, actually the day I got back, I get a text message from my doc saying, hey, do you want to set up that Holter monitor? I thought, well, yeah, I guess I said I was going to do that after spring break. Kind of surprised you remembered right away, right? But so I go in. I get the monitor. Well, as I'm in our office, we're discussing the Holter monitor, how it works. You know, it's got a, like a cell phone that you attach to it so it can send signals. It's, you know, <laughs> you're no longer carrying around reams of paper with you or like they probably did in the old days. And we're discussing the pricing. So almost all of my pa- my physician's patients are cash pay. In fact, all the patients previously who'd had a Holter monitor, they just pay cash for it. And the price was $250 for this test. So that's where you bill. That includes the, the monitor, bar, you know, renting it for a week, and includes someone to interpret the EKG rhythm strips for the however long you have it on. And it's a 250 is sort of a flat fee, whether you do it for three days or a week. We sort of settled upon six, seven days and thought that if there's any sort of dysrhythmia or some problems, it would probably show itself in that time period if there was anything you know significant. But the unusual thing with me, as far as a patient for her, is I actually have insurance through my wife's work. But again, I have switched to her because she's not that expensive. It's only $50 a month. Plus, I have much better access to a physician should I need one. And strangely enough, I actually needed one. I hadn't probably needed to see a doctor for a couple of years. Well, we discussed this for a while and she said, why don't you just, do you want to submit through insurance? And I said, well, I think that's probably reasonable because I'm pretty sure we've hit a deductible for the year. Why don't we just do it, submit it to insurance? And I'll just, you know, we'll see what happens. Had a week of a test, turned out negative, of course. But the interesting thing happens about six weeks, maybe five weeks after the test is complete, I get a bill in the mail from the company that, and I recognize the name of the brand name of the company, the Holter Monitor. Now, the bill I get is because my insurance denied the claim. The bill was for $5,000. So I've just now received a bill for $5,000 for a test that I could have purchased initially had I not bothered trying to submit it to insurance for $250. I immediately freaked out and called my doc and said, hey, does this even seem right? She promptly has a heart attack, not seriously, but just figuratively. And then she said, hang on a second. She promptly contacts the company that does holder monitoring and they give her this following explanation. Well, yeah, your insurance company almost never accepts these. So we send them a bill, they deny, we send them a bill, they deny, we send them a bill, they deny, and then we just send a bill to the patient. And a bill that we'd settle around about $250. So essentially I've just gotten like a test for free for a couple of months, but you have to pay it, in, pay it a few months from now. So essentially it's not any different than had I just paid right up front or just agreed to the, the cash price. And on its face, this entire episode seems really kind of funny and you know comical if it weren't for the fact that there's a lot of money at risk. Because here's the other scenario that goes through my mind after I get talked down off the ledge by my doc. I suddenly started having this concern that what if my insurance company accepts the charges? I mean, according to this company, that really never happens. And so this is sort of just a strange exercise that they perform with or dance they perform with the insurance company. We just kind of mail things back and forth and eventually just say, I would just bill a patient. But what if my insurance company suddenly accepts this charge and they say... Well, here's your bill. This is a $5,000 test. You have met your deductible. Your responsibility now is 20% of the bill. So now suddenly I'd be stuck with a $1,000 bill for a test that I could have purchased initially for $250. Or maybe, as is often the case, the insurance company will send you an explanation of benefits that says, this is what your bill would be. We provided savings to our whatever savings mechanism that we have, and so your bill is actually only... $3,000 and we pay 80%, you pay 20%, which is $600. 
Well, again, that's not much better than what it'd be to start with. But it really gets you thinking about what's really wrong with the system. Because there are a number of problems with the way this whole transaction and process worked. One is, and I think it was the first fault was my own, and then I thought, oh, well, maybe someone else will pay for it. And this is the, the tragedy of the third-party payer system, right? I said, go ahead and submit it to insurance. I may pay less. I've already paid insurance. And that way, I don't really care how much the test costs, right? I mean, I guess when we made the, the initial discussion, we discussed price, which is kind of weird for a doctor's office. I've not something I've done before, and probably most of you haven't either. If you're a physician, you probably don't often talk about costs for patients. Some of you do, certainly well, those of you in the retail cosmetic services. But I elected to try and get something for free, essentially, and I was not a consumer or shopper of the services. Just because of the physician I went through, I was getting sort of the best deal or whatever you might want to call it with a cash price, and I had an idea of what the services cost. But I certainly wasn't very conscientious in looking at prices and trying to find the best deal. The second strange occurrence in this was the fact that my physician, who was in direct primary care and a licensed physician in the state of Michigan, board certified, blah, blah, blah. There's no reason that the insurance company would should deny services just because the order comes from her. Yet it did. Kind of a strange thing. But again, we'll say that that's okay because the insurance company can decide who they accept from ordering things because they feel they may have better control over costs or expenses by controlling the, the size of your network. But again, it's a little weird. But that's just the way it is. The next strange thing, of course, is that the insurance company would deny the service. That's not unusual. But what is weird is that there's this expected dance between the insurance company and the, in this case, test provider, where they would send the bill, fully expecting that it be denied, get the denial letter, send it again, and they do do this a couple times with the expectation at the end they just have to bill the patient. Now, obviously, you think there's some cost in mailing something back and forth, having someone hired who processes this claim and sends it to the insurance company, certainly some of the insurance company who views a claim, denies it. Maybe you have to go up the chain after it's come two or three times. I'm not sure. But the point of it is there are people involved making these decisions. This is not all automated. And they're paid to do something that essentially is going to provide of no value to anybody, not to the provider who is making the, you know, it's a monitoring company, certainly not to the patient. I mean, I'm out of this conversation entirely and definitely not the insurance company who has to have somebody to deny things and just, you know, say, we're not going to do that. It's really kind of a goofy system that's designed really not to do anything of value except to just shuffle paperwork back and forth. This is your classic, your bureaucratic nonsense and administrator costs that we always talk about with medicine. This is obviously on an extremely small scale. This is just one test in one example, but the example's evident. Finally, my realization at the end of this is that I may actually be on the hook for more money than I would have paid had I just paid up front. Well, that's kind of strange. I mean, you would think that the whole point of having the insurance, if you're going to be expecting to get healthcare coverage to it and you know healthcare expenses paid for, that you'd end up paying less than you would have paid had you just walked off walked in off the street without any insurance at all. Yet my situation is, despite having hit my deductible, despite having the insurance company cover, and I'm using air quotes, which is not very useful in the, uh, on a podcast, but the, my insurance company will cover most of the expense, I still would be paying more than what I would have had I not even had insurance. That's kind of crazy. And I would even add one last thing, is what is the deal with a, the device company selling the service for $5,000 that they would accept $250 cash. I'm quite certain that they did not spend $4,500 or actually $4,750 in order to process the claims and send it back and forth to the insurance company. I mean, clearly this is a jacked up rack rate price. And this is what we all complain about. Like you see the prices on the, the explanation of benefits or when you look at the, how much it costs at the pharmacy, yet your copay is $10 or whatever. And so what's the real cost of things? Well, we know what the price is, but the price is very different than the cost. And so the cost is significantly less than what's charged. And you have every incentive if you're the device manufacturer, if you're the pharmaceutical agent, if you're the hospital, if you're the you know, physician office, to jack up your rates as much as possible in order to maximize your revenue. I mean, everybody does it. Everybody knows they do it. Yet, it's just the way things are done. And so this is kind of the screw, again, another screw report part of the way the healthcare system works. But 
all of these steps, all of these stuff that was done in between me had I just walked in and just paid 250 versus later going through a billing departments and transferring through the insurance companies and the device manufacturers or the, I should say, the monitoring companies. It was just a tremendous waste of time, resources, money, and it didn't accomplish anything at all. In fact, it provided a negative value for me, even in the end. And so it's really hard to know when you look at this small situation. Again, this is a very small, limited you know, thing that, I've, that occurred to me, that has occurred to probably everybody who I'm speaking to on some level, some to a much greater degree than what I have experienced. But it's a microcosm of what is really wrong with the healthcare system in this country and why it is so expensive. There's so much just ridiculous nature of the way we actually conduct business. In fact, it's even hard to even say you're conducting any business at all. And I think, you know, if you want to say, well, let's move to a single payer system. Well, how would a single payer system in any way be any better? Because the only difference is that I guess at some point it would have been accepted and maybe it would be accepted 100%. But it's 100% of a $5,000 claim. Now, maybe you say, well, they're going to, you know, demand they can't charge that much. Well, how much do you think they're going to charge? You think they're going to they're going to agree to $250. I guarantee that's not the price they're going to agree on. They're going to agree on far greater than $250. And so every person that's going to get that Holter monitor is going to be paying far more than that. So it's going to, I suppose it'd be great for the Holter monitor company, except they're going to have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars lobbying and negotiating to try and get the price maximized, which is a, a price and a process that is of a cost, I should say, that is of really no benefit or value to any patient or even to the, the system in large or the country, you know, it depends on who's paying for this. And yet that's a lot of resources that are going to be spent. A lot of people have to be working and doing these negotiations, and yet it's not really going to provide any useful value for anybody at all, except, I suppose, the people who are personally profiting from it and milking the system. It's also the really thing that's tricky to recognize in a market economy, in the, a market system, is really how prices are even arrived upon. But it is through just... People valuing whatever it is, test or their time or, you know, the R&D that goes into something, the, the scarcity of the product or, you know, how you know, rare something is, but that all can lead to a price discovery process. You know, you can be a painter and you can charge $100 an hour. You can be a painter and charge $9 an hour. You can be a painter and charge $80 an hour. Well, there's probably going to be a generally accepted price for what a painter costs in your town. Now, it's going to vary somewhat, but there'll be a, some sort of market for it. There'll be a, a price that's accepted. There's ones that you're just like, you're just crazy. I'm not going to pay that much. Or like, wow, that's really cheap. You're either terrible or I'm definitely going to hire you and you'll never have, you'll be super busy. And there's that balance you find. And whatever it might be, if it's skill or you know some sort of thing that's a value or that's in, in great need, like if you're someone who's trims up trees, well, suddenly you can charge a lot more if you wanted when at times people need their trees trimmed. Now, there's obviously a cost to that. If you charge too much during those times, people are like, well, this guy's just trying to rip me off now. Or you just charge a good reasonable price, stay busy the whole time. You know, those are business decisions people make. But essentially, there's a market that that occurs, and it is hard to sometimes imagine that it, it does happen, yet it does for every product that we purchase for the most part. If you go to the grocery store, if you go to the hardware store, whatever, Wherever you go, for the most part, outside of a few things in a few things that you might purchase, like healthcare or maybe like you know an education, higher education, most of these things have a market price, and I would even argue they have somewhat market price, except that it's a strange market price and that it's dictated much by this goofy system with you know where you have regulatory capture and you have all these only certain people who are allowed into the market. And all those players who are allowed into the market set aside so that they would be the ones who could make those decisions, whether it's through licensing schemes, whether it's through regulatory hurdles. Fundamentally, then, what we're essentially left with is a system that is far more expensive than it needs to be, added costs, added regulatory or administrative work, that it serves no purpose or value, doesn't even do anything as far as improving quality or cost controls, if anything, it just increases costs. It makes it more difficult for you to have any sort of price transparency or any idea how much the care costs at all. Plus, you have a disinterested party purchasing the product, which would be the patient, and those selling the products as far as when it comes to cost or quality. When it comes to the insurance itself, I've 
really started wondering, especially with this new episode in my life, what's the value of the insurance anyway? Like, what is the real risk for an average person? Now, I recognize there are times, there are times, there are expenses, there are things that come up that are unanticipated. Uh, a visit to the emergency room, a surgery that you have to have, obviously some sort of injury or illness, pregnancy, which, you know, could be planned or not planned in the span of nine months, depends when you purchase your insurance, of course. There's certainly expenses that happen within healthcare, but it makes you wonder when you see the jacked up price here. I mean, my test was at a 2000% markup when billed to the insurance company, even at a discount, maybe it's a thousand percent markup or 1200%. That's really insane. And so it really makes you wonder what the value is of the insurance paying all those premiums, the total out-of-pocket costs, and what would happen if you just didn't pay anything at all and just lived without any insurance at all. Now, I know there are people who are going to say there are plenty of people uninsured. It puts you at risk for financial bankruptcy, but there are a lot of people without that choice anyway. There are also a lot of people who really don't incur much medical expenses at all, and so you're essentially just throwing money and just setting it on fire because the chance of something catastrophic happening is pretty low. Now, maybe you could buy a catastrophic coverage, which we don't really have in this country anymore. You could be part of a health sharing ministry, pay a couple hundred dollars a month or something like that. Those are options that are that seem far more reasonable. And I really wonder how much it would cost you to get the medications, the usual sort of the, the everyday expenses. Like when people talk about insurance, they generally are thinking about these sort of the common everyday occurrences of care. They're not astronomical in prices. Like a $250 test is not cheap, but it's not like something that's going to break the bank for most people, nor would be a visit to the to your primary primary care doc of you know $75 or $100 or something to see a specialist. I mean, all those expenses can generally be covered over time by most people. It, obviously, we're not talking about the $20,000 know, knee replacement or something like that, but we're talking about just sort of your everyday, the common routine sort of things that happen. I mean, obviously, a good example would be you know, getting your oil changed, right? You know it's going to happen at some point. You maybe, maybe you budget for it. Maybe you don't. Most people probably don't usually budget for oil changes or getting their tires replaced. But those are the sorts of things that I think are, that are sort of like equivalent to this, where you have just the routine maintenance. And what if your insurance didn't include all that? Would be, many people find much value in that? And, and would you insist on using your insurance to pay for those things? And this is when I talked to Kevin Way Casey about health insurance and how to pick the right one. Dr. Way Casey is an emergency physician. Now he does some DPC work. I think he's in Oklahoma or Texas. I can't recall. But he wrote a book on, called Healthcare Economics where he just sort of goes through these calculations that most Americans don't make. And I, and I lump myself into one of those most Americans. Because, you know, you look at your plans, you're like, well, okay, do I get the gold, the silver, the platinum? What sort of deductible do I want? What sort of premium am I going to pay? And his thing is, really the thing you need to focus on for the most part is what is your maximum out-of-pocket expenditure? Because that's going to be the best way to, to understand which is the best plan. Now, if you never use any sort of health care for the, for the year and you don't utilize your insurance, then you, know, you can maybe make a rational decision there. But most people will pick things like, I'm going to pick the platinum plan. And the platinum might have really high premiums, a low deductible, but essentially with the amount of premiums you've had over the year, in addition to the deductible, you end up pretty much right where you'd be if you had picked the low premium, high deductible plan. But the other thing that's even more insidious that has really come more to the forefront with this whole episode is the whole notion of what does the insurance company actually save you with the purchase of these products? Even after their discount, after them covering 80% of the cost or 90% of the cost, are they saving you any money? Are you paying a tremendous amount of money towards your towards a deductible where they don't cover anything, yet you're paying the rack rate, the, the insurance cost of whatever the procedure is, the office visit, the laboratory test. Uh, and then even when you get to the deductible, are you even saving you money even on top of that, after, even after they're covering most of it? And I, I you know, I when Dr. Way Casey mentioned this, I, I guess I believed him, but I thought to myself, ah, you know, it's probably an exaggeration sometimes that 
you know, an ultrasound's a hundred dollars. And then you tell me a blue cross blue shield and they say, Oh, okay, well that's $150 copay. And the patient will say, Oh no, no. I mean, I, I'm going to not use insurance. They're like, well, as soon as you said your insurance, now you have to be, yep. We have to accept your insurance. We can't charge you enough for rate if we knowingly know, you know, if you, we know that you have insurance. So maybe it's insurance is not even worth much anyway. And so where's, where does it lie in how you want to take care of your healthcare expenses? And it, it makes me rethink a lot of things that I thought I had taken for granted, like the discounts they provide for your copays and your medications. Would you be better off not having the insurance, not ever paying that premium, not meeting that deductible, and paying the full price on pharmaceuticals? Because I can see the prices that on GoodRx, for instance, or through my doc, who provides medications at wholesale prices or 10% above wholesale, which is cheaper than GoodRx at times. Usually it's no, obviously no worse than GoodRx. You always can go through GoodRx. But, you know, when you're saving $500 a month in premiums or maybe $1,000 a month, you've got to buy a lot of medications to suddenly cover that $1,000. And it makes you question, you know, would it be something you could get a, if there was a, the ability to get a catastrophic plan at a much lower rate that would truly cover your hit by the bus horrible infection, you know, you get a weird skin infection, could you become septic or something like that. If you have somebody who just covers that stuff, you know, it's going to change things significantly as far as your calculations for what does and doesn't make sense financially for you. And it makes you just kind of call into question, I think, the entire system. And and then, you know, you can go even further and say, well, do you even really need insurance for those occurrences? Because if no one was using a third-party system and you had to have transparent pricing from the outset for pretty much every hospital stay in, hospital procedure, whatever, and there'd be shopping around between hospitals now. Obviously, not every hosp- you know, town has the ability to have multiple hospitals. But you know, maybe if you had more of a market, you could have something like that. I don't, you know, I don't know. It's hard to know what could exist if, since we have a totally different system. Uh, much like when Dr. Booth and he was saying that everyone in the H- who in, in Britain said, well, we can't imagine having not having the NHS. They're great because if we didn't have it, people would just die of heart attacks, making the assumption that there would be nothing to replace it if they suddenly get rid of the National Health Service. It just, there'd be nothing there to, you know, sort of, no one would ever think about having a business to say, take, treat, treat people who are sick. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I think those are things that are worth pondering. It's uh, a great example of just how messed up our system is and how there's so many layers to it and so many things fundamentally wrong that sometimes you think there's just no way around it. But it is neat that I am sort of living outside the system now. Now that I have a direct primary care physician, I can go and I pay $50 a month to have my care through her. I can get medications to discount rate. I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> I can't utilize it because I don't take any medicine, but um, that possibility is there. And then I could have got this test for cash price at, you know, before the 2,000% markup. And so I think there's there's room and there, there are people who are showing their ways around this. I know I've mentioned this before many times, but I do not think we need to be so pessimistic about healthcare. I do think people are having solutions that work. Even in our current system, they're still finding ways to work. You can only imagine if we were to unlock the system to more competitive pricing, to more market solutions, to more people being innovative and allowed opportunities to find solutions to these problems that we have in delivering the care that it'd be so much better for all of us, cheaper, probably better quality of care, probably more options. All things I think most people would want in this country. Most people want affordable health care. Most people want to have the option to go to whoever they want to for care. Most people want to be healthy. They don't want to go bankrupt doing it. And I think there's we can get there. But I think we have to allow sort of the market to find ways and people to find ways to deliver the, that care and just allow it to happen and to not use the heavy-handed government to impose regulatory burdens, to not force mandates, and to prevent people from doing what they want to do, whether that's physicians or patients or hospitals or surgery centers or implant producers or pharmaceutical manufacturers. I think we just kind of let let things just happen a little bit more organically. I think we get to a lot better place. This is a pretty great country. There's a lot of innovation here. There are a lot of people with really great ideas, a lot of energy, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people looking for 
solving problems that I didn't even know I had. I didn't know I needed a computer to carry around in my pocket. Yet, here I am walking around with a smartphone. There's people who have found solutions and added value to my life that I never, would never have anticipated. And I think we can do the same thing in healthcare. But I just think we need to allow, unlock that entrepreneurial spirit. We need to allow that to organically grow in this country. And and I think, you know, the things we address in this podcast, whether it's direct primary care, health sharing ministries, we talk about insurance, we talk about electronic health records, we talk about hospital systems, we talk about administrators, we just talk about just ways to practice medicine, to avoiding burnout. I think a lot of these things will never be perfect, but I think we can make them a lot better. And I think, I think by spreading these ideas, by thinking about them more critically, and if you're out there and you're someone who can provide that or you have a business op- idea, if you're not in healthcare or if you are a physician, I think you just go for it. I think, I think these things are what are, are going to make healthcare better for everybody. And you might have the idea that's going to maybe just not radically transform the entire market, but you might fix your little corner of the world and make it a little bit better for patients and, and for yourself as well. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little discussion looking at the 2000% markup, how I got ripped off by the insurance company or manufacturer. I'm not exactly sure who to put the blame on. Maybe it's myself, <laughs> everybody. And let's hope I end up not getting a bill through for my insurance at my discounted rate, which is actually more than I would have paid had I paid cash right up front. So let's hope I get lucky there. And I hope that things work out for you. And if you have more interesting ideas, if you have innovative things you see people doing, please send me a note at the Paradox Show at protonmail.com. You can go to my website and get access to it there. Obviously, you get a Patreon page and support me there as well. But I really appreciate you listening. I appreciate you sharing. And I hope that you have a healthy tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash theparadox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com.